morning. Happy Easter. All of you are welcome. He is risen, and we believe for it. I believe 
I didn't do something weird. Yeah, I did. No, oh, no, I guess it's on. Is it on, Tim? But no. Okay, the green light isn't on, so. Okay, now we're on. So I'm a big fan of uh, Doctor Who. So, um, and if you don't know who Doctor Who is, it's a British series, but he has a TARDIS, and a TARDIS is a phone booth. And it's a, like a British phone booth. And it's about the size of a phone booth, except when you walk into it, it's probably bigger than this room. It's an illusion. So I decided that if I was God, don't worry, I'm not. Um, when Mary went to the tomb, I'd make the tomb a TARDIS. So when she walked in, she may see the angels, but behind the angels, she'd see a big band. And they'd be playing. And they'd be singing, Christ the Lord is risen today, and it'd just be horn sections and everything. I think this is absolutely wonderful. So amen, amen. So I was trying to think about today. It's not really a day of faith. It's a day of fact. Uh, you know, it causes faith, but they weren't really celebrating hoping. They were celebrating the reality of what happened. So today we're going to read a confession we used the other night at Good Friday to begin this day, and then we'll celebrate the truth, hopefully, of what today represents. Let us read together. Gracious Father, you sent your Son to die and to rise to new life in order that death be brought to an end and that we may live a new life in him. Yet we confess that we have too often chosen to remain captive to doubt and fear and ways that lead to death. By our thoughts, words, and actions, we have scorned your love, diminished the lives of others, and defaced your image in us. Father, forgive us for Jesus' sake and enable us by his resurrection power to live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again for us. Amen. Let us pray silently. God, we thank you for today. We thank you that we can celebrate a fact of your resurrection and that it does produce faith in us, faith to believe that we can be new creation, that we can be loving, compassionate, giving people, reflecting who our Lord and Savior is. Bless this day and help us to bless others in our journey through life. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. So like our pastor said, today we celebrate. So let us stand. And this next song is called Risen. I would love for you to learn the, uh, the chorus with us. It's really, really simple. Could I get an E just so that I can be in key? And the chorus goes, risen, is risen, forever glorified. Risen, his risen, King Jesus, King Jesus is alive. I know you can sing that. Would you stand with me and let's practice it one time. One, two, three. Say, risen, his risen, forever glorified. Risen, risen, his risen, King Jesus. King Jesus is alive. And that is super simple. You, you can do that, right? Now turn to your neighbor and say, he's risen. He's risen. He's risen. Put your hands together. And you're going to sing that with us. Forever glorified. Today, we celebrate the Lord is alive. Yay! 
You know it with us. because he is worthy of it. His love is unfailing, unending, and he is here for us. Every praise. Praise him where you are. Praise him with your heart because he has given us life. We have been forgiven. Yes. Would you put your hands together? Every praise is to our God. Every worship in one accord. Indeed it is. It is. Our worship is to you, Lord, this morning. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah to our God. Every prayer. 
You know, we've got some friends today, as you can tell. There is more people up here, and we have a wonderful brass section. We have Martin, we have John, we have Phil. Back there, you know Carlos already. We have Les on guitar, Frank on guitar. You know this guy, Abe. Of course, you know this guy, Ralph. No. <laughs> uh, and I'm Marlene. So we are here to worship for the Lord to open up the heavens and bless us today. You are in the house of God. You are an overcomer. You could have slept in. You could have had a nice brunch. But you are in the house of God, and that is a blessing to you. So we want to bless you today. Let us sing, open up the heavens. We want to see you. Help us out with your hands. Show us, 
show us, show us your glory this morning, Lord, in your house. Show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. years, uh, mainly because of COVID, but at this time, we're bringing the flower cross up. Uh, Barbara Johnson started it this year. Helen Johnson did it. She did an amazing job, but this is to, for us to remember those who have passed in the last year, friends, family, people we've heard of, and right now we hear about death all the time, but this is on the day of resurrection. We want to symbolize those who we've lost. So in your mind and in your thoughts and in your prayers, just remember anybody you've lost or my right now, yesterday my wife went to four funerals uh, for her family uh, at the same time. And so it's a day to remember. So thank you very much. And thank you, Helen. You did a fantastic job and a beautiful centerpiece. Amen. have a responsive reading that we will be doing. Um, so I will go ahead and read the leader part, and uh, the rest of you can read the congregation piece um, when it comes to your turn. So you can see it on the bulletin, and it'll also be up on the screen as well. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. In him was life, and that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. The true light that gives life to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God children born out of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word, as the word became, became flesh and made, and made his, his dwelling among us. us. We, we have, have seen his glory, the glory, the glory of, of the one and only Son, and who came, came from the Father, full of, grace, full of grace, grace and truth. Amen. Okay. All right. So a few years ago, I was sitting here thinking, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here. I haven't seen some of you in a long time because 
maybe come on Easter, but also because of COVID. But I was sitting here thinking, realizing this is my 27th Easter here, and uh, it's glorious to see a lot of you people, especially people I know and see every once in a while. It's Easter. And I thought about this. A couple years ago, I preached on Easter on that it was a reality check, that we all have reality checks in our lives. Um, kind of, first one you probably remember is, it's when your reality is changed. Probably the first one I remember is not getting something for Christmas I wanted, you know, and then pouting about it, you know. And then, of course, in high school, the big trauma was having somebody break up with you or not getting a date, you know, and you all of a sudden your whole world's coming apart because of this. And then as life goes on, you have different reality checks. You can have mild ones like, you know, that you your business doesn't go well, you, you can't buy the right car. I mean, you have those things, but you also have dramatic ones like death of a spouse or death of a friend, bankruptcy, you may get thrown in jail, you uh, may do terrible things. And all of a sudden your whole life, that you knew the day before is not there anymore. Well, this is what happened on Easter. And we're going to see in a minute to the disciples. Uh, this, nobody has had the reality check they had because this is how it kind of came down. We look at this, and um, we kind of set the stage, right? So um, uh, Jesus, you know, the disciples, this is what's important about the reality check. The week before is, good, you know, Hosanna, the triumphal entry. You know, everybody's cheering and having a good time and party and throwing palm branches down. The disciples finally come to a point with, well, maybe we've made it. See, because all the time they're with Jesus, Jesus is always getting in trouble. And the Pharisees want to kill him. And so everywhere they go, they're aware of this. So for this brief moment, even though the Pharisees are in the back and do not like what's going on, the people... Because he has raised Lazarus from the dead. He has come with a group from there. People are coming to the, past, uh, the feast. And there's hundreds of thousands of people probably there. And they all join in and they have this big uh, parade. And they're all saying things to Jesus like, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save us. So the disciples are feeling pretty good. You know, they're you're looking around. Because, you know, if you're not famous... The second best thing is to hang around famous people. So they cuz everybody looks at you like how do you know them? You know what's special about you? And we like that feeling. I, we can't deny that. I I I have had a few instances of that and it was wonderful. Well, then Jesus has a dinner, intimate dinner. Only 12 people besides him are invited that we know. So, and then he does this weird thing where he washes their feet. Now, people don't get, oh, everybody used to have foot washings. I'm sure they still do. I, I've never liked them, so I'll tell you that right now. And the reason I don't like them is because we don't wash feet. You know, it's not normal for us. For them, it was very normal. They, they would go into house after walking all day in the desert, and the servant would wash their feet. So they were used to it. What they weren't used to is that the Messiah was doing it. So it was very uncomfortable for them. Not the foot washing, but who was doing it. So at the end, he talks about loving your neighbor and, and, you know, this is going to end, but they don't understand. But they're still feeling good. They have a private dinner. They're in an upper room and everything else. Well, then everything radically changed. At midnight, Jesus, I mean, they go out to the garden. At midnight is the trial, and the verdict comes in the next morning. Now realize this. The trial was illegal. It violated Jewish law. They bribed the witnesses. Pilate declared him innocent, but he was so afraid of the repercussions with Rome, he let the crowd decide. Jesus is tortured, crucified by the Roman army, and they're very good at what they do. You know, I read this big long thing that they wanted to keep him alive as long as they could so they can torture him some more. I don't know if that's true. These guys were experts in crucifixion. At one time in Jerusalem, when they would come through and they would kill people, they were doing 500 crucifixions a day. And they finally had to quit because they ran out of trees. This is the Roman army. They're, they're, they, they don't care about Jesus. You know, 
And we've said before, the Roman army didn't kill Jesus. The Jews didn't kill Jesus. Jesus gave up his life. If he didn't want somebody to do something, he wouldn't do it. But he gave it up. And then Joseph of Arimathea asked boldly, because he's very wealthy and rich and influential, he goes and says, can I have the body? Which they didn't think anybody would ask for. So he moves him into his burial tomb, big tomb. Jesus could have never afforded it. He brings in 75 pounds of spices to embalm the body, to honor him, okay? So that's kind of the setup for Easter. So in John, now the disciples, they're afraid and they're hiding, right? And so that, and the, the, they didn't want to go to the resurrection because it was on the Sabbath that the tomb would have been there. Jesus was always criticized for breaking the Sabbath to the point they wanted to kill him. So the disciples aren't coming out of the house on Saturday. They're scared to death of the Romans, I mean of the Jewish leaders, the elite, they're probably looking for them. So they, nobody visits the grave on Saturday. So that's where we're kind of coming up to. So early in the morning on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday, Mary goes to the tomb. Now, they think that she went between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. It's dark outside. She is not breaking Sabbath, but her love compels her to go. This is the real division here you got to understand. The disciples, who were these brave men, are scared and hiding in a room. Mary, who has no power, no authority, no position, because she loves the Lord so much, she has to go to make sure that the grave clothes, the embalming is done right. So she shows up in the middle of the night, and I would imagine walking around at that time probably wasn't the best thing in the world, but it's still dark, and she comes. Now, John only says it's Mary. Uh, Matthew said it's the two Marys. Mark says it's two Marys and Solomon, and Luke says there's two Marys and Joanna. So they tell different stories. The reason John, like we've said this before, John is not worried about all the facts being there. He wants to show what Jesus did and what the Messiah was. So he only centers on Mary because Mary is so important on this day. You, you know, we can never underestimate how powerful Mary is. So she's there by herself, according to John. And... Um, She's the one that fell at his feet and worshiped him when Lazarus was in the grave. She's the one who uh, put oil on him. So, and she's the one that is always around him. So she has this love, like a mother's love. Even more, you would think maybe the disciples would come there, or maybe his, her mother, and, and one of the gospels think maybe his mother was there. But she loved him so much that she had no fear. And, and I think only mothers understand this for your kids. You know, you have that kind of love that fear is not important if you're going to talk about something about your children. So she shows up with this love. And this is the paradigm shift that we're going to talk about. Because what happens is the kingdom of God isn't about fear. It isn't about following rules. It's motivated by one key factor that she had, love. That's what Jesus is going to reward. Because to him, that is the ultimate characteristic of the kingdom of God. It's something the church has missed a lot. But, you know, we hopefully will reinstitute it. So, she gets there. And uh, she looks. And the stone has been moved. Now, this grave is uh, big. It, they think the stone weighed between 600 and 700 pounds. It was rolled on there. It was, and because the Jews thought the disciples were going to steal the body and fake a resurrection, they went to the Roman government and said, we want it sealed. So they seal it, and then they put Roman guards there. Now, Roman guards know that if anything happens to that grave, they will be killed as punishment. But I'm sure the guards, I, I read this the other day, and I thought, yeah, that's true. The guards probably said, oh, what are you doing this weekend? I just got to stand in front of a grave all weekend. It's going to be an easy job. It wasn't. And, and remember, if you read the gospel stories, they were told to make up a lie. You know, oh, it's okay. You won't get in trouble. Just make up a lie that somebody stole his body. So they're there, and she comes to, likely, I mean, she comes to the grave, 
And so she went there to finish the burial, and she saw the stone was removed. That's all she saw. And then she ran back to the disciples. She said, oh, no, it's gone. So remember, she has no power. Now, who is the head of the disciples? Peter. He's what we call the architectonic center of disciples, okay? Now, remember, this is remarkable in the kingdom of God because what did Peter do just before this? He denied Jesus three times. But Jesus, the Bible says the callings are about repentance. Jesus said, Peter, I called you. Oh, you're going to fail. You're all going to fail. If, if I cut you out every time you make a mistake, there wouldn't be anybody following me. So we have to get over this idea that you have to be good enough or things. I'm sure the disciples weren't happy with Peter for what he did, but they also know that Jesus had instituted him as the head of the disciples for ecclesiastical reasons. But he's hiding. And so, it, you know, I heard a song this morning, and it said he was upstairs and he was hiding. I heard a knock. He thought it was the Roman guards. I mean, this is all made up, people. Well, he looks down, it's Mary. So he goes down to let her in. So Mary comes in and tells him, listen, they stole the body. The body's gone. So what happens? John and Peter run to the, they want to go see this. They don't believe Mary. You know, it's funny because God uses a woman who was not in any power in the Roman or the Jewish state to uh, bring the word of God to the people that should have the word of God. They hid in fear. She came in power. And she just came. I, I have to inform you. The body's gone. Oh, they said, oh, we don't know. We don't know what they've got. But they ran off. So, you know, they make a lot of uh, talk about that John was younger than Peter. So I guess Peter's huffing and puffing trying to get there. And John ran ahead. Or some people believe he knew a shortcut because he lived there. So he, he'd cut through the some other way. But he gets there first. He looks. He kind of sticks his head in the tomb. And he sees the grave clothes are laying there folded. He doesn't see the napkin that would cover the head because it's off to the side. But when Peter gets there, Peter being like he is, I mean, we can read all the other things. He's just brass and bold. He just walks right in. He said, I want to see this for myself. And he looks at these. You know, uh, somebody pointed out to me one that it must have been remarkable to see that a man had folded his clothes. But I'll just leave that alone, okay? <laughs> and there's an old saying about a napkin that's placed over the face is that when they would eat at that time, when somebody would finish their meal, if they wadded the napkin up, they weren't coming back. If they folded their napkin politely on the table, and meant they were coming back. Jesus, this is folded. But the interesting thing about it is it's not just folded, folks. Remember when Lazarus was raised from the dead, he came out and his kind of his grave clothes are all tattered, and Jesus says, take his grave clothes off. See, because somebody who's resurrected or resuscitated is what we're going to see. When Jesus Lit, uh, brought three people back from the dead. They were res resuscitated. They weren't resurrected. This is the difference. He brought them back to their former life. Jesus did not come back to his former life. The resurrection is a whole different idea and concept than just bringing somebody back to life. But he said, even then, you got to take the grave clothes. So when they looked at it, they believed the grave clothes were there as if the body just disappeared. Whoop, it's gone wasn't disturbed. It weren't robbers. Robbers would have either stole the whole thing with him in grave clothes, or they would have ripped the grave clothes off to steal the body. But they would not have perfectly laid it down, and the headpiece would not be laid and folded off to the side. This was very shocking to them, because nobody would have seen something like that. They would have thought, well, nobody's been in here. So they look at this, and Peter says, whoa. And it said that John went in and he looked at the thing and he believed. Now, some commentators believe that he only believed that Jesus' body was stolen. But when they say this, it, the way it's said is, no, what he believes is the body is gone. It's not stolen. 
because of the way the grave closed us. And he believes what Mary said. They, the body's gone. What, what happened? And they do not understand what happened. It even says in John, they did not understand the resurrection until later. See, so these guys are, and her are learning. They look at it and all they know is it's gone. You know, what are we going to do? So what do you think the disciples do? They run home. Mary stays, shows something, but I won't go into it. She's crying. She's weeping. You know, some people believe that he didn't recognize Jesus because she was weeping. That's not true. I don't think so. But she's in there, and all of a sudden, there's two angels in there. Well, I didn't see this before. And they ask her, why are you weeping? They took his body. Now, Realize this. This is what, how they think it happened. She's in the tomb. She's facing the two angels. They think maybe the angels signaled because they, they don't say a lot behind her or maybe she heard something. Well, she turns. So she turns around and she sees a man standing there. She thinks it's the gardener. And the reason she thinks it's the gardener is because only a gardener would be there that early in the morning. If they were gonna, if somebody had paid them to go check the tomb or something like that, they would go early in the morning before everybody came. It's not the position of a gardener, you know, that it was lowly. It was because of the time frame. So she looks and then uh, she said, "Did you steal the body? You know, tell me where it is. I'll go get it." Which makes no sense at all. Mary couldn't have got the body. She's not even thinking logically because of her heart. All she wants to know is, I want to know where my Lord is. This is, I love him too much. If you've taken it. And they believe that she turned back to the angels. So she wasn't seeing who he was. So when he said, Mary, she turned and said, Rabboni, teacher. It's only one other guy said that, a blind man, when Jesus healed him, because he could not see who it was and he thought it was God, he said, Rabboni. Now, Jesus is a teacher, and he is teaching them things. We did this recite, this reading, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he is the Word. He is a teacher. And this is as far as they understand at the time. But she didn't recognize him because he's different. Remember the disciples on the road? They didn't recognize who he was until he said, you know, something, and their eyes were opened up and they saw who it was. It wasn't like he was a ghost. He was a person, but somehow something altered that they wouldn't immediately do it, but they knew the voice. My sheep know my voice. And besides that, he said her name. And to me, that is the amazing thing. God doesn't see crowds. He doesn't see big stadiums. He doesn't see mega churches. He sees people, no matter where they are, whether they go to church or they don't. He knows everybody by name, and he knows everything about you and his character, your character and everything. He knows that. And so Mary responds to that, and of course, she said, he is risen. You know, I'm, so now I've skipped ahead. The disciples are back, still in the room, scared. Why are they scared? This is their reality check. Jesus has died. They've lost their jobs, their home, their power, their influence, their best friend, their reason for living, their faith, their religion, their external security, and their commitment to life. They have no place to go, no reason to live, and no personal strength. This is a reality check for them. They've lost everything. And it isn't just like they went bankrupt and while well, we gave up our houses and our fishing uh, company. They realized this was somebody we knew. This was God. How, how, if he died, what, what do we believe in? How can we believe in a God that can be killed by the Roman soldiers? So that's where they are when she runs in and says, oh, he is not dead. He's but Mary was different. She loved Jesus. She had no fear for herself. She stayed and cried, saw the angels. And that, they pointed to Jesus. She heard a sound. She turned around. 
The angels didn't answer, but he knew her name. She knew his voice. But what was happening here? He said, don't touch me. We don't know why she, he said this. There's three reasons they believe, the scholars believe. One, that she just wrapped her arms around him because she couldn't believe it was him. And he said, hey, don't cling to me. Probably wasn't it. Secondly, he said, don't touch me in that way because uh, I'm not resuscitated. I'm not the person you knew. I'm resurrected. And I'm, I'm not here for you to hold on for life. I'm not going to be your savior in your life. You know, 50 years from now and you have some problem, you can't come to me and I'll heal it. I'm not going to be here. And then the other thing they think he might have meant was, listen, I haven't gone to my father yet. Remember, he stayed 40 days. He said, we'll have time for this. You're going to have 40 days with me. I'm going to be teaching you. I'm going to eat with you. I'm going to have Thomas put his finger in my hands and my feet. He said, we have time for this. So he wasn't saying, don't touch me. Because he, he touched them and he ate with them and everything. But he was trying to get her to understand, this is a new paradigm. Your reality has changed. And it's not based on your faith. It's cha- changed on a fact. The universe has changed at that moment. People don't realize this is, you know, we talked about this on Good Friday. There's such thing as, that I call that it's a God thing. There are certain things that do not are not affected by the immutable will of God, are not affected by people. They didn't control it. They may think they did, but there are certain things that God has said it's a God thing. Jesus died, it said, from the beginning of time. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He knew this was coming. This is a God thing. You know, you benefit from it. But this is a God thing, just like the resurrection. It's, it's not about that you hope so much or you love so much that I came back. This is a God thing because I'm changing the universe at this point. Colossians is very clear about this. You know, everything in heaven and, and earth and below the earth, everything was reconciled and repositioned. And we can hear, talk about all the things that were affected by Jesus, whether people believe him or not. But from a God thing, he said, this is a fact, folks. It doesn't matter what your feelings say. It doesn't matter if you believe in me or don't believe me. That's your choice. But the facts never change just by your belief. And this is what Mary is now facing because he's trying to show her. He said, let's go talk to the brothers. He's never called the disciples brothers before. Some people believe he wanted to talk to his brothers, but that was probably not likely because his brothers weren't believers yet. And his, the people that he wants to share this with is the disciple. Their reality is going to change. They got a reality check, and right now everything's at the bottom. But they're going to find out everything has been changed for all eternity. And so she tells him to go see uh, and talk to him. But her interest is this. Where did you go? When did you go? Why did you go? And who are you really? These are all questions that she has in her mind, you know, and she wonders where you've taken him. The whole universe has changed. Why? You know, this was an original plan by God. This isn't something new that Jesus just thought up on the fly because Roman killed him. This is something that before the beginning of time, before earth was even created, this plan was put into motion by God completely before any of you were born, before anybody was born on this earth, Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do, and nothing was going to stop that. You know, so it started with Jesus. Who are you? Jesus said, well, it starts with me. But it doesn't end there. The God thing is, I changed the world, but I only did it for one reason, for you. You know, think about that. God didn't need to die for God. There's no problem between God and God. They didn't have a lack of love. They didn't have some justice to be filled. They didn't have any sin to cover up. They, in the Trinity, it's perfectly harmony and love and peace. So this isn't about God doing something for God. People always want to make that God had to be appeased by Jesus. No, he didn't have to be appeased because he put the plan in from the very beginning. It's a God thing. But he said the God thing was for one reason. It was for you. I did this for you. Some of you don't know what I did. Some of you don't believe what I did. 
you know, you can have all the doubts you want, but what I did is a fact, and you can experience this if you want to. So when it comes down to it, it comes down to this. We have a new position of power based on love. It's based on the resurrection. It has to do with who are we. It's about standing in his presence and not letting go of Jesus until we know what to do next. That's what he said. He wasn't talking about Mary, don't cling to me. He said, no, but don't let go of me till you know what to do. That's what I did. I, I, you know my voice. I will never leave you or forsake you. You can know who I am. The reality of knowing, when I say to people, listen, I'm more convinced of Jesus' reality than you sitting there. They can't understand that. Well, you can't touch him. You can't call him down. No, but I can look back over 50 years and see his hand so clear in my life every time. And the miracles that I have seen are unbelievable and undeniable. So that's what it is. It's the resurrection, the new life. We're not to be resuscitated. We're not to be people that become like the same old person we were and we just add Jesus. You know, like adding a new part to a car or buying a new house or having a new job. We just added to the old life. No, he said, no, I don't do that. He said, just like me. I didn't resuscitate myself. I didn't come back to who I was except in my, car- in my, in my human nature is changed, but my God nature never changes. But he said, when I resurrect you, which you are living resurrection, it's a totally different thing. It's the truth of what it is. So let me conclude today with a, a little thing that was said. It's by Charles Colson, if you know who he is, from Watergate. And I think it concisely tells us what happened. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. And then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put into prison. They would not have endured that if it wasn't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You keep, you're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Let's pray. God, there's so much to that day and those times that we don't fully understand. But we know you did a major shift. You shifted it to not people of power, but people of love. You shifted it to people who believed in what you did and who you are. And God, we don't testify to some hope that we have. We testify to a fact that changed the world. And in many ways, we don't know how. But someday we will all know. I pray that everyone here would have a glimpse that when their reality comes up to be checked, that they will see the gift that is given to them and the love that encompasses them. And we thank you in your name. Amen. Amen. Check, am I on? Okay. Well, we are going to end with one more song, and this song is called This Is Amazing Grace, and indeed it is. Would you stand with us and uh, let us sing this together? Let me get my stand. And as you go out, let us just remember that All we celebrate, the reason that we're alive is because he is alive and he is risen. So happy Easter, all of you. Amen.
we sing about that lamb who is worthy to be praised. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. The only one. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. He is. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. afterwards if you can stay. I know people on Easter have a lot of plans, but we were just wonderful to see you all, to see your face making this a great Easter. I want to thank the band. You know, you guys are great, you know. You know, and we're, we're not trying to lift up individuals when we clap. What we're trying to lift up is God's given them talents, and we've been blessed by their talents, and that's what we're thankful for. So, amen. But have a great Easter. Have a great year. Anything we can do, let us know, and it's just wonderful to see you all. So let's pray. God, what can we say? He is risen. He is risen indeed. The greatest fact, the greatest gift of love that transformed and renewed and made us new. We ask that more people would understand that it's the love of God that is important to hear his voice and know that he knows your name and he died that you might have life and life abundantly. Let us go out sharing the joy and peace we have today with others and making this day a day of celebration. And we pray in your name and everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. If you can stay, go next door to the fellowship. Ah!